genera that we work with are Alternaria, Fusarium, and Aspergillus. Um, we have five different isolates that we're working with, and the, the really unique thing about these isolates is that not only are they, they isolated from the roots of selenium hyperaccumulated plants, but um, within these, this specific niche, they're able to, or these plants are able to hyperaccumulate up to 20,000 ppm of selenium, which makes this area not very, very habitable to most things, like in animals and bacteria, which are known to use selenium um, within selenoproteins such as glutathione peroxidase. Um, the the window of toxicity and necessity is pretty 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 small, but um, in evolutionary context, the paradigm is that both plants and fungi have lost the ability to code for selenium and this, therefore don't use selenium within these um, proteins like w animals and bacteria do. So one thing that we found in our lab is that when we when we culture them on like malt extract broth or potato broth, that they actually seem to grow better in the, in the presence of selenium rather than just on regular controlled media. So what we, I guess the, the main question we wanted to know is, you know, is this just a tolerance response? Are these fungi just tolerating the selenium in their environment? Or is there maybe a, a, a larger picture that there's some kind of physiological benefit from selenium? So what we wanted to do is first we wanted to look at, you know, are these, fungi experiencing a stress response. And the way that we do that is through an assay um, that measures lipid peroxidation. So this specific assay um, directly looks at the reaction of uh, lipid hydroperoxides with a ferrous ion. The, um, in that reaction, a ferric ion is made and then the ferric ion then interacts with a th thiocyanate. And at that point, uh, the thiocyanate is the chromogen and it can be measured spectrophotometrically and um, you can see an increase in absorbance and therefore you, get a, you can gauge how much stress is, is being experienced by that fungi. So originally, the first step in our process was to measure, measure the cell, cellular stress. So it was kind of a two-step process. The first thing is, was, was the fungus stressed? And we kind of down here at the bottom, we looked at the schematic that we used to, to isolate this. So stress, yes or no. And then we, we moved on to, um, as I had said earlier, an uh, enzyme known as glutathione peroxidase. And the, the importance of this specific enzyme is that in fungi, and it's not thought to use selenium within the active side of that specific enzyme, um, it's, it's the commonly held paradigm is that it uses sulfur, whereas in humans, animals, in general, we use selenium within the active side of that, that, pro, that specific enzyme. So we wanted to look and see what the effect on glutathione was. So what we, again, we met, used a specific assay uh, that measured indirectly um, a, a cascade reaction that eventually measured the, the oxidation of NADPH to NADP plus. And by, by measuring that, there was actually a decrease in absorbency at 340 nanometers. Um, and by that, we could again tell how much GPX or the GPX activity that was in our samples. So, so again, go back to the schematic. What we did is we said, all right, is there stress? Are these, ex or are these five isolates experiencing stress? Or, and above that, um, is there an increase or decrease in glutathione peroxidase activity? So we ran statistical analysis um, with, for each fungus and each treatment of either 10 or 30 ppm selenite and selenate versus control, um, and then actually ran them through the schematic and said, so is there stress? If there's not stress or there is stress, what is the effect on glutathione peroxidase? And the, the kind of the interesting thing that we, we kind of keyed in on and made, made for future studies is if the specific fungus wasn't, it wasn't experiencing any stress, no lip, not an increase in lipid peroxidation, but then had a increase in glutathione activity, um, is, there, is there more to the story than rather just them tolerating selenium in their environment? Um, and so, out of the five different isolates that we have, two of them are alternaria. We call them A1 and A3, alternaria, astragali and alternaria selenifila. So A3 was kind of our, our model, model fungus. And it, it out of all the, the fungi that we studied, had that specific response where it had decreased lipid peroxidation and then an increase in glutathione activity. So it kind of, for many reasons, um, metabolites, um, 
you know, kind of, again, contradicts the paradigm that we know that, you know, selenium and fungi is normally a toxic thing. You know, it's used in humans for things like dandruff and other, uh, other ailments. So now we have a fungus that seems to be responding, um, is responding uh, positively, I guess, to the presence of selenium. That, and then we compared that to um, A1, which was Alternaria selenifila, and that actually only showed a positive response uh, to the presence of selenium on one of its four. Um, and that happened to be the, the specific, um, kind of the, the concentration of selenate that it experiences most generally in its environment. So the other um, finding that we found and we thought was kind of interesting was that um, Aspergillus leporis, which we know as AS117 and AS2, um, which are known to be or thought to be the same species and um, but have different tolerances to selenium and they both had very different outcomes. Um, uh, some of AS117, which is thought to be selenium tolerant, actually seemed to experience more stress. Um, so we, I guess the beyond that we're, we're questioned, you know, it's, it's thought to be a high volatilizer, it's able to volatilize dimethyl selenide, so um, does that come at a cost? So it, it kind of highlighted, at least for us, that even though you have one species that may be different isolates, that, that, that we may be looking more at the individual rather than broadly at just the species. So, and that pretty much summarizes what we looked at in, in these fungi. Again, it was what we found was there was a variety of different responses, even with this group of fungi that is supposed to be unique and is able to, to inhabit an area with very high selenium. So you know, beyond just being a tolerance or maybe an ability to be more fit in their environment, there may actually be some type of a physiological benefit. And that's hopefully something we can continue to, to research and hopefully find the answers. So. I thank you for your time, and I'd just like to thank Wyoming Embry and the NIH for their grants. Thank you.